If God is your father, this is your history. We have some information for you to consider about the calendar God gave to man before the flood, about the timeline of events recorded in this book, about the days we are living in and the days that are soon to come. We have good news. The Book of Enoch describes a calendar that all Israel was to observe forever until the new creation, when the new heavens and the new earth are created at the end of millennium. In this calendar, there are 364 days in each year. Each year has four seasons, and there are three months in each season. The three months of each season follow this pattern. 30 days in the first month, 30 days in the second month, and 31 days in the third month. If you add up 30 plus 30 plus 31, you end up with a total of 91 days in each season. And 91 days times four seasons equals 364 days in each year. In most of the world, we observe a 365 day year. And every four years, we have a leap year where we add an extra day to the month of February. This extra day in February is called an intercalation. And the purpose of this intercalation is so that the length of our year stays in sync with the seasons. Intercalations help us avoid what's called seasonal drift. Enoch's 364 day calendar does not stay in sync with the seasons. So most people who use his calendar add intercalations to it in the form of extra days, extra weeks, or extra months. But when Enoch wrote about the 364 day year that father showed him, he didn't say to add any extra days or weeks or months. And the Bible doesn't speak about adding any of these things either. So when it comes to how we view the biblical timeline and the scriptures, we don't add any extra days, weeks, or months. We use a 364 day year every year, starting with Adam with no intercalations. One impact of observing the calendar the way that we do is that feast days, like Passover, drift through the seasons. How are we okay with this? Well, I'll give you a few reasons. One, we think that the calendar that Father showed Enoch matched the natural order of things at the time that it was shown to Enoch, meaning that before the flood, we believe the earth revolved around the sun once every 364 days, not every 365 and a quarter. Since Enoch said that his year is the year for feasts forever until the new creation, we're keeping it the way it is, forever until the new creation. And I believe that ancient Israel could have kept it this way as well, regardless of any seasonal drift. I say that because Father told the people of Israel that if they listened to him, he would send them rain in its season. It says in Deuteronomy 11, For the land that you are entering to take possession of, is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it, like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all of your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. In other words, Father would make things work on his clock if Israel was righteous while they were in the land. That may sound impossible, but we have a lot of examples in the scriptures of Father overriding what we call the natural order of things, in preparation for Sabbath years and Jubilee years, the land was commanded by Father to produce more than it did in other years. In the wilderness, if you gathered Father's manna and kept some of it aside until morning, the manna would stink and would be full of worms. 
but that would only happen six days a week. On the seventh day of the week, the leftover manna would be perfectly fine. Father overriding what we call the natural order is the nature of all miracles, and Father does miracles. So I am fully confident that he could have made things run on a 364-day clock in Israel if he wanted to. Another reason we have no problem with seasonal drift is I think Enoch actually prophesied that it would happen. He wrote that in the years of the sinners, the fruits will be tardy on their fields. If you look at the difference between a 364-day year and a 365 and a quarter day year, you'll see that each year the fruits show up later and later than they should. They are tardy on our fields. How the earth went from a 364 day year to 365 and a quarter days as it is now is up for speculation. My guess is that it could have easily happened as a result of the violent geological events that occurred at the time of the flood. As you may know, earthquakes over a certain magnitude can change the length of a day. For example, in my lifetime, there was an 8.8 earthquake in Chile and a 9.0 earthquake in Japan. And it was widely reported that both of those earthquakes affected the rotation of the Earth and shortened the length of our day by a few milliseconds. If you read the account of Noah's flood in the Bible and in Enoch, there was geological activity occurring at that time that was so intense it would have made a 9.0 earthquake seem like nothing. Moses says the fountains of the deep were broken up. That is literally the Earth being ripped open and waters bursting forth all over the world. Enoch records that prior to the flood, the earth was shaken and was tilted. And Enoch also saw a vision of what the flood itself would be like. He described what he saw like this. Heaven was thrown down and removed, and it fell upon the earth. And when it fell upon the earth, I saw how the earth was swallowed up in a great abyss, and mountains were suspended on mountains, and hills sank down upon hills and tall trees were torn up by their roots and were thrown down and sank into the abyss. What he's describing is incredibly violent movements of the earth. And this wasn't just at the beginning of the flood. If you look at the dates in Genesis, when the waters began to go down, at first they go down slowly. Then suddenly the rate of draining speeds up. As Enoch describes in another chapter, this is because new abysses were opened up. This is Earth being torn open again for the second time during the flood event, this time to receive the waters. All of these descriptions are indicating to us that there were massive movements of the Earth before and during the entire flood event. Were these movements enough to change the length of a year by one and a quarter days? Maybe. One day I believe that the Earth will be back to a 364 day year, and I suspect that when this happens, it will be a result of the geological events that are coming soon as part of the day of the Lord. Isaiah records that in that day, the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Ezekiel says that the mountains will be thrown down and every wall will fall to the ground. All of these words from the prophets sound like earth-changing events similar to what happened in the days of Noah. For father's children, there is no need to worry about earthquakes of any size. As he protected Noah, he will also protect us through what's coming. It's written that heaven and earth will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people. you
In early 2015, we asked Father if we needed a calendar, and if so, that he give us one. And he said to us that in two months, three weeks, and four days, it would be the ninth day of the fifth month on his calendar. He also said that the Jewish calendar was not his way, but that in two months, three weeks, and four days, from that day that he spoke to us in early 2015, the Jewish people would have the date correct as a sign to us that he was indeed speaking to us. We immediately went to a calendar hanging on the fridge, and we counted two months, three weeks, and four days. And the day that it landed on was July 25th, 2015. When we looked up that date online in the Jewish calendar, they were indeed observing what they call the ninth of Av, or the ninth day of the fifth month on that day. Since that day, and since Father gave us that clear sign, we have been keeping track of the days. Once Father gave us the date, I wanted to know if it was true that Sabbath is Friday night. So we asked him, and he told us that the answer would be in the 21-day fast of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 10, we read that Daniel mourned three full weeks, and that three whole weeks were fulfilled. This told us that Daniel was speaking of three full weeks in Father's calendar, from the first day of the week through the Sabbath, meaning that the next day after Daniel's fast was the first day of the week. And the scriptures actually give us a date for the day after Daniel's fast. Daniel 10 says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, according to the understanding that Father gave me, this meant that the twenty-fourth day of the first month, which is called Aviv, had to be the first day of the week. Dates always fall on the same day of the week in a 364-day calendar, so if the 24th day of Aviv was on the first day of the week in Daniel's time, it would also be the first day of the week in Yeshua's time. Now, a few years before this, I had done a study on the crucifixion, and I arrived at the 17th of Aviv as being the day of Yeshua's resurrection. And John says that resurrection day occurred on the first day of the week. There are a lot of details on how I arrived at that resurrection date in our video called The Mystery of the Last Supper, if you're interested. But what you'll notice here is that what my research told me, which is that Aviv 17th is the first day of the week, matches what Father later led us to, which is that Aviv 24th is the first day of the week. Since Father had given us July 25th, 2015, which was a Saturday night, as being the ninth day of the fifth month, we were now able to build out the entire calendar, and we could see that Sabbath was on Thursday night. On our website, you will find the calendar that you see here on screen, and there's a free calendar kit that you can use to keep track of the days if you're interested in doing that. One thing you'll notice on our calendar is that the first day of the year is on the sixth day of Father's Week. We don't know why he said it this way, but to me it makes perfect sense, since he created man on the sixth day and this calendar is for man. Another thing that you may notice on our calendar is that we have the days beginning at sundown. This is based on a few scriptures. In Leviticus 23, Father describes the day of Yom Kippur as something to be observed from evening to evening. In Exodus 12, he says the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to be observed from evening to evening. And in the Gospels, we read about Sabbath day as approaching in the evening, and the first day of the week as having already begun before sunrise. Altogether, these scriptures are telling us that Father's days begin at sundown. Enoch seems to agree, since he describes the sun as returning to and rising from the east. That is a description of nighttime and daytime, respectively, and in that order. Enoch also alludes to the sun's setting in the west as marking the completion of a full day. He says, And the sun sets in the first portal in the west of the heaven, 
and the sun has therewith traversed the divisions of his orbit. Since that verse that I just read has a word in it that some people find confusing, we're going to go on a bit of a tangent here. A lot of teachers have sensationalized the subject of portals, so I'd like to clarify for everyone that when Enoch talks about the sun traveling through portals, what he's describing is actually quite simple. He's simply saying that the sun is lower in the sky in the winter and higher in the sky in the summer. He describes there being portals in the east and in the west that correspond to the various positions where the sun rises and sets throughout the year. In the spring and summer, the sun rises at the eastern positions numbered 4, 5, and 6, and it sets in the corresponding western positions numbered 4, 5, and 6. During these months, the sun is higher in the sky and our daytimes are longer. In winter and fall, the sun takes the paths labeled 1, 2, and 3. These months are colder, and the sun is lower in the sky, so we have shorter daytimes. Each of Enoch's portals are simply set points in the sky where we can expect to see the sun rise and set from in two months out of each year. Father's calendar, as described in the Book of Enoch, is what the world calls a solar-only calendar. On the first day of Aviv, the sun rises and sets, and after it has risen and set for 364 days, that's a full year. But some people think that based on Genesis 1.14, the biblical calendar has to also be determined by the phases of the moon. In Genesis 1.14, Father says, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let me show you how these words from Genesis are fulfilled even with a purely solar calendar like Enoch's. The Hebrew word for seasons is moedim, and it means appointed times. One such appointed time in the scriptures is the time of the end. It's written that in the last days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will turn to blood. And Enoch speaks of the stars straying from the order that Father set. These are all signs in the heavens occurring in their appointed seasons. In the Psalms, we read that Father established the sun to rule the day and the moon and stars to rule the night. And in Genesis, we learn that part of the function of the moon and stars is to divide the day from the night. So the moon and stars represent night itself. Without night, there would be no days. There would be only one long permanent daytime, forever. And if it was always daytime, then there would be no years. So the very existence of the moon and stars and the night that they rule and represent are essential to the 364 day count that makes up each year in Father's calendar. If you've studied the biblical timeline, you're probably aware that most Bible teachers don't use a 364 day calendar to date events from the scriptures. They tend to make use of two other calendars that we believe are actually unbiblical. One of them is the modern Hebrew calendar, also called the Jewish calendar, and the other one is the so-called 360-day prophetic year calendar. Whether you realize it or not, these two calendars might have influenced your own thinking about the biblical timeline and end times prophecies, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining why we avoid them in our studies. For a long time, it was assumed that the modern Jewish calendar, which is lunar, was the one that was used by ancient Israel. However, these days it's more widely known that at the time of the Second Temple, different Jewish groups had different calendars. Some were lunar, and some were solar. The moon, as Enoch describes, has its own days, months, and years. And he distinguishes between a lunar year and a solar year for us, and he lets us know which calendar we should use, because as we showed earlier, he said that the year for appointed times is the 364-day year, 
which is the solar year. He also says that a year for the moon alone is 354 days long. Since the years of the moon alone are the basis of the Jewish calendar, and since Father told us that this calendar is not his way, we avoid using it. We also avoid it because it relies on the addition of a 13th month to stay in alignment with the seasons. And this 13th month is a particularly troublesome intercalation, since there are several references in the Bible to there being only 12 months in a year. In 1 Chronicles 27, we learn that David made divisions of officers and leaders of men according to the 12 months of the year. In 1 Kings 4, we learn that Solomon had an officer for each month who provided food for him and his household, and that the total number of officers was 12. There is another possible reference to the number of months in a year in Revelation's description of the Tree of Life, which, depending on how you translate the verse, yields either 12 fruits or a single fruit 12 times a year, according to the months of the year. The Book of Enoch is also clear on this matter. It says there are 12 leaders to divide the months. Enoch prophesied that men would be in error regarding four days of Father's calendar. We believe that this prophecy is fulfilled, at least in part, by the modern use of the so-called 360-day prophetic year. This calendar is used by so many Bible teachers and Bible scholars that you may have been influenced by it without even knowing it. If you think that the 1260 days of Revelation is the same as three and a half years, that's because whoever taught you that believes in a 360-day prophetic year. The 360-day calendar year theory was made popular because of a book called The Coming Prince, written by Sir Robert Anderson in the 19th century. In his book, Anderson used a 360-day year to apply dates to Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy and to date the crucifixion. But using a 360-day year has no biblical basis. Here's one of the reasons that he used it in his own words. Anderson wrote, If tradition may be trusted, Abraham preserved in his family the year of 360 days which he had known in his Chaldean home. At original Hebrew, we do not think that tradition can be trusted, and we also don't think that Father bases his calendar on the calendar of the Chaldeans. As another proof for his 360-day year, Anderson says that in the Genesis flood story, 150 days is, quote, specified as the interval between the 17th day of the second month and the same day of the seventh month. And this claim has been repeated by many people since Anderson's time, but it is simply untrue. Let's take a look at what Genesis actually says. In the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. This scripture is giving us a date for the start of the flood. The waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. After the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Proponents of the 360-day year theory make the assumption that the day the water started going down is the day the ark landed on Ararat. The scriptures don't actually say that, but people make that assumption. On a 364-day calendar, the Ark would have rested on Ararat on day 153, not day 151, which makes sense to me since Moses records that the waters on day 150 were 21 feet above the tallest mountains, meaning it would have taken some time for them to drain before Noah's boat could safely land. As one more proof of his 360-day year, Anderson claims that one half of seven years is, quote, described twice as 1260 days in Revelation. But this is also untrue. Revelation never says that three and a half years equals 1260 days. Here's what it does say. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, 
and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. The assumption that Anderson and many others make is that the 42 months of the nations trampling the holy city is the exact same amount of time that the two witnesses prophesy. But if you keep reading in Revelation, the nations are still trampling the city after the 1260 days of prophecy have ended. It's written that the two witnesses prophesy for 1260 days and then they're killed. And in the days that follow their murder, the people of the city won't allow them to be buried, and the whole world has a huge party for three and a half days. The city is still being trampled, and the end is not yet, because 42 months is longer than 1260 days. 42 months in Father's calendar is actually 1274 days. The prophets prophesy for the first 1260, then they lie in the street for three and a half days after that. That leaves 10 days before the end of the 42 months and before the end of the age. As a bit of a side note, I have a hunch that in those three and a half days when the wicked of the world are celebrating the death of father's prophets, those same people are saying that peace and safety has finally come to the land because the two witnesses who tormented them with father's judgments are dead. Paul tells us that once they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. If you're a watchman, you know, like I do, that governments and people have been holding peace and safety conferences for many, many years now. But that phrase for now is just a hope and a dream. I think what Paul is describing here is humanity thinking that they've finally achieved their dream of peace without God. But lo and behold, in just a few days from their peace and safety celebration, our dream comes true. Our Lord returns and he takes his place as King of Kings. Looking at the biblical timeline from the perspective of a 364 day year has some very interesting implications for end times prophecies and for our history from Adam. For those of you who have studied the book of Daniel, you know that the number 2300 is part of the end times prophecies. There's something very interesting that I noticed on Father's calendar. On a seven-year timeline, 2300 days is the number of days between Shavuot, aka Pentecost, in year one, and Yom Teruah, aka Feast of Trumpets, in year seven. We're not exactly sure what this means, but we know what it could mean. We'll talk about that soon. Still with you.